thanks for uh, coming by. Um, today, I'll try to give to those who are not in this space. How many of you are, have heard about problems in energy to begin with? Ah, OK. So, OK, so this has to do with energy. Um, um, so this is uh, um, um, the Department of Energy has launched a new program called Rapid Operational Validation Initiative, which is geared to accelerate the development of energy storage systems. So I'm uh, the, I work with the other, uh, it's, let's see which way, oh, there we are. I work with other five labs, uh, Argonne, Idaho, Oak Ridge, Enrel, and Pacific Northwest in uh, trying to make sense on how to uh, consolidate battery data at different levels and then use it to accelerate development of batteries. So uh, today I'll kind of try to take it one step at a time. Uh, and if at any point any of you has any questions, just stop. I mean, it's a small group, so ask questions as they come to mind. Um, I'll try to make the case of why energy storage is important and why we need multiple technologies. Um, and then uh, how battery systems are modeled into something that can actually be simulated because these are otherwise intractable problems uh, made of millions of variables. So how do you reduce it to something that actually people can do something on a computer or even a supercomputer cluster? And um, how uh, the industry, both academia, national lab, and industry as such, has developed a cascade of tools to try to uh, predict battery degradation. So uh, for uh, those of you who haven't heard, uh, the U.S. has a renewable mandate, uh, and the idea is to try to decarbonize as much of the grid as possible by 2035. And one way to decarbonize the grid is to replace fossil fuel with uh, renewable sources, like wind, uh, solar, and to slowly phase out some of the fossil fuel. With that, though, comes the problem that you don't have reliable generation anymore. So energy storage becomes an integral part of the electric grid. And energy storage has always been on the grid. Uh, for those of you who follow the industry, the only reason pump hydro exists is because of all the vast nuclear energy production we had in the US. And nuclear plants like to generate electricity steadily. They really don't like to go up and down. So there was no need for electricity at night. And that's how pump hydro actually came. And that's the same for compressed air storage. Now, instead of just having to deal with nuclear at night, we have to deal with renewables during the day, and then we have to deal with additional other problems like electric vehicle charging. So if you think of an electric vehicle charger, it will probably, even a moderately fast charger, imagine you want to recharge your Tesla in 10 hours, is going to take about twice the power that your house will take almost in any other situation, right? So, how do you add enough buffering near the distribution? That's another reason to have energy storage. And then there are what are the more long tail applications. So somebody did a study, this is Dargon National Lab, where they looked at uh, what it will take to go to a 100% renewable grid. And then you find that as you increase the percentage of renewable, you're going to need more and more storage. And this storage, sometimes we love to operate for multiple hours or multiple days. So we had a little taste of this uh, when there was the freeze in Texas, for example, and all the wind stopped functioning. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was just no other way to produce electricity and electricity prices spiked for a lot of people. Uh, another area in which you already see some of these days to weeks is in Northern California, for those who live there, where sometimes the utility will just decide that to protect themselves from lawsuits, they will disconnect circuits to prevent fires, and people have no electricity. And so, but in any case, as you have longer and longer duration electricity, the value of that, of that energy storage goes down and down. So if this is the current cost, of a lithium-ion system, whatever is in your car today, for those of you who drive an electric car, the, va the cost of the energy storage that can take care of day and seasonal storage can be more than $10 a kilowatt hour. 
that's like one thirtieth of what the lithium ion battery costs today, right? So in order to um, create technologies that can meet these price points, you can't use lithium, you can't use cobalt, you can't use nickel, you can't use any of these materials. You have to use materials that are literally as cheap as dirt. And uh, a lot of these uh, new companies, and a lot of, most of these companies are US-based, I would say the vast majority are. They use things like zinc, uh, they use things like manganese dioxide. So like this one, this was my former company. So let me just give them a shut up. Uh, Urban Electric Power, they, use, they made the old traditional Duracell rechargeable. It doesn't get cheaper than that, right? So, and, but in addition to have electrochemical solutions, it's some thermal storage solutions where basically people are engineering particles that can retain a lot of heat, a very high temperature, like 600 Celsius, and can be used instead of coal to run traditional steam cycles, like power plants and things of that sort. But the problem is like all these technologies will most likely take a long time to come to fruition. So this is a little busy chart, but like, let's bear with me. So in 1970 is when the original idea behind the lithium ion battery was invented. So it was called the rocking chair system. It basically the idea that you can shuffle lithium ions back and forth between anode and cathode. That was it, that was the discovery. Since then, it's engineering. And if you think about it, like, let me see if I can. Uh, around this time is, oh, around this time is when the Sony Vio came out. It's the first lithium batteries. They, they changed the market, right? They, all the other laptops disappeared from the market almost overnight. This is so much lighter. And then here is where the batteries that we use in cars have become robust. So, but think about this, now we are like 30 years away, right? And uh, people have been trying to optimize lithium by adding silicon in the anode for the last 20 years. They still can't figure it out, right? So obviously developing batteries takes time. Why does it take time? Well, it's because it's not a straight down process. Um, you start with the, some idea of what the basic pieces of the technology have to be, uh, the electrodes and what materials you're gonna use. Then you're gonna make cells in the lab and scientists are really good at making whatever they make in the lab work. Those cells are gonna work. But then, <laughs> but then they're gonna invest maybe, I don't know, and it's not I'm talking by experience here, they invest like 10 or $15 million into manufacturing lines, and then they make production cells that don't work. And that's simply because the cells they made in manufacturing don't match the cells that were made in the lab. And the conditions in which these cells are operated don't match the very ideal conditions that uh, were used in the lab. And one example is this one. You can see, like, you know, even if you don't know batteries, right? I mean, this is the current and this is the voltage. You can see how nicely charged and discharged these batteries are, right? So a battery under these ideal conditions can last in a lab like years. And this is how they're used. You know, they're like discharge, charge, charge a little bit, and then the power goes down. And there is a, yeah, so this, uh, and I was telling, this, this, this battery, this particular one is kind of funny. This one was, was installed in India by me and my group when I was there. Uh, this one lasted three weeks. So back to the drawing board. So what we are trying to do uh, with the Ravi is to see if for this new batch of technologies that DOE is supporting anyway, like the 14 or 15 technologies I was describing before, if there is a way in which we can look at stuff in the lab, systems, system in the fields, full deployed system all at the same time. Is there a way in which we can orchestrate the modeling, archiving, data, everything that has to come so that we can kind of study these systems and see what problems you find up the chain in less than the 30, 40 years that traditionally has taken. That's how, that's how long it takes. So, and, and the reason we are doing this is because if we want to meet this 2035 net zero goals, it does take four to five years for people to 
commission projects. And this slide was made in 2022. And it, take two years, it took two years to get the proposal approved by DOE. So we're already in 2024. So we only have six years, right? So the idea is like all these technologies that are now supported by the Department of Energy, we want to try to find ways to accelerate their development over five to six years instead of the 15, 20 years that has taken traditionally. And so we are developing, uh, I shouldn't call it, maybe you scratch this. It's like your talk where you scratched things. Yeah. <laughs> we are developing a data hub. So we are developing a data hub where uh, my group is responsible for the data collection and the integration between models and data at all layers. Um, Oak Ridge National Lab will maintain the software infrastructure simply because they have like a large cloud computing uh, platform. Uh, NREL and Argon will contribute most of the modeling part. Um, we'll all kind of work on generating as much data for this. And this is the data will come from the system and the way these systems will be tested will also be designed in such a way we can accelerate learning. And all this information will go in what's called, in science, digital twin. How many of you have heard of digital twin? Yeah, it's an unfortunate term. It just basically means you're trying to build as close to reality of a, of a physical model as you can, as, as a simulation, right? Okay. So, and uh, the data hub will somehow expand on some of the data that we did with Battery Archive. So Battery Archive is a site that we started at Sandia in 2020. It's, open, it's based on open source software. It's basically a place where you can ingest data, put it in the same format, and then export it through JSON APIs. And believe it or not, this is the largest repository of lithium ion, public repository of lithium ion, lithium -ion data in the world which we, we didn't really, when we started it, that was not, we thought we just like we're kind of an N plus one kind of thing. But that highlights one of the big problems in the battery industry is that nobody shares data. Everybody tries to hold on to their own information, which is a problem like, you know, maybe yeah, you guys have with proprietary software and hardware and things like that. And, and the reason people don't share data is because it's difficult to get data. Right? So they don't, wanna, they don't wanna give it. Like some of this data that we show in Battery Archive, the first data set we put in there is data set that was collected at Sandia over a seven year period. Right? So once that was there, then a friend of ours from Hawaii put his own, and then somebody from UL, and, and now, you know, now, now, now we have a pipeline of data sets where people actually send us data and we just don't have enough time to read online, which is a nice problem to have. So, and this, but the data we've kept in battery archives so far is for individual cells. If you, I don't know if, if you guys have ever seen a lithium ion cell, I mean, it's like cylindrical will be this way, prismatic will be like a red brick, right? So, but if we wanna predict the performance of, it, of a system, we gotta go from cells to modules to racks battery management systems, power conversion systems, this entire system has to be modeled. And that's where the complexities begin. Uh, not only you have to have a representation of an individual cell, but then you need to figure out how all this will work in the systems. And you know, some of the system will have 200,000 of these cells. So it's not just one or two, like the typical system will have in the hundreds of thousands of this. The initial test I think at 70,000 little cells. So that gives you an idea of how the systems are actually built. So now I will go into some of the transition between how you actually model the behavior of batteries. So for those of you who like physics, this is the, this is the time to, to shine. I'll try, okay, let's see. So, all right, so this is a schematic of how lithium ion battery looks like. So this is the anode, this is the cathode, the anode is basically made out of graphite. It's just like tunnels. You can think of this like tunnels. And these lithium particles during charge will go from this complex metal oxide. It has, could have nickel, could have manganese, could have cobalt, all kind of stuff, right? It forms a matrix that retains the lithium 
ions when they're completely discharged. And when they're charged, they get shot into this graphite matrix. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons if you charge your battery and it's cold, you damage them because the graphite is not very flexible. So all this little yellow thing will bang on the surface and destroy. And if it's too hot, the graphite will kind of deform forever. So even if you don't use the battery, when it gets too hot, you'll damage it. Right? So th those are like, this one is a little more resilient. But you can see already that all kind of stuff can happen. So it's not that you're going to make a thousand batteries and they're all going to work the same way. Right? You're going to make a thousand batteries and they're going to work differently. But yet, if we want to build a digital twin of lithium ion or zinc manganese or something else, we got to start from this, from this level of modeling, right? Because this is, that's where the physics happens. And people have tried all sorts of approach. So, and a lot of this, uh, so the first thing one has to do is to take this very complex structure, which is simplified here, and reduce it to something that is more tractable. So there are two approaches that have been used in the literature. One is pseudo, pseudo two dimensional models. They basically, they take one electrode and they turn it into a series of spheres, which are further away on one side. And there is something in the middle and there is another set of spheres on the other side. Uh, another one, which is even simpler, is single particle models. So where you take all these spheres collapse into kind of pseudosphere. This isn't really a sphere, but it's a physical. It's like a way to represent the complexity in the simplest possible form on the anode and cathode side. And there is an electrode on the side. So now, as you do that, you're making a lot of some assumptions. And that's where the need for data in battery really begins. So like, look, for example, at this J, the flux. This is how current moves depending on what the voltage across the terminal is. This is, and this is the earlier question in this talk. This is approximated using something that's called the Butler-Volmer equation. It's basically a potential. It basically says that in order to push the more current during charge, the voltage has to go up. And in order to discharge faster, the voltage has to go down. Right? This is our intuition, right? Voltage determines the flow of current. But the funny thing is like this equation has parameters. So now that you have reduced from this to that, how are you going to get the parameters? And this has plagued the industry for a very long time. Because unless you make them up, right, there is no systematic way. And that's what has changed over the last, I would say, decade. These new experimental uh, techniques, this is called focus high beam scanning electron micro microscope. It's just as expensive as it sounds. This is really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> really expensive piece of equipment. But what it allows you to do is to look at the structures as they're cycled, which is pretty phenomenal, right? So you can see, like you're starting with the fresh, where is my copy? fresh electrode, and you can see, you get the idea that all the particles, so the little spheres, are all the same size. And 50 cycles, I mean, this is like no more than 50 days of a new iPhone, right? This is how they are. Everything is broken at the top, and uh, everything is as, it's just like this chunk at the bottom. And yet this thing still works, right? And it's like, so, so now it's kind of like, how do you go from this to the parameters that you need in order to have a realistic but simplistic model of the system? And this is actually, one of the first, this is like the type of open source work we do. So there is this group, NRL, which is the Renew uh, National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. And they have, the, they have created a MATLAB toolkit. How many of you have you ever used MATLAB? Yay. OK. <laughs> yeah. So it's MATLAB toolkit. And um, the MATLAB toolkit actually is designed to produce the parameters that go in the other models, right? So now the question is, will these people share the data with these people? I doubt it. But if they were to do that, then you know these models, these, these parameters will go into models. And this is actually a very nice uh, public implementation of the single particle model. 
this was de developed by a group at Oxford and is becoming the de facto standard now for uh, uh, single particle models, which is the one I was showing where there was one particle on the left, one particle on the right, and the electrode in the middle. So, and you can see, and you see plots like this. If I find my, okay, so this is the capacity. So how much charge is left, and this is the number of cycles. And you can see that, uh, I think this is the experiment, and this is the simulation. You can see that at least the behavior is there. But it's not correct, not exactly correct, but there is at least the physics is in there, right? If somebody could actually, somebody actually knew what the parameters said and what was the complexity in that particular cell, you know, get a better agreement. And then one can start doing things like, oh, look at that. So if you look at this plot, the blue curve is a measure of degradation. And then you say, okay, fine. This lithium battery under this condition is not degrading during discharge, it's mostly degrading during charge. Okay, so now you can go back and say, how do I charge this thing? Which is one of the reasons why your iPhone is becoming a little bit more particular on how you charge, like they stop. I don't know, like look at this actually, you can see, right? Actually, yeah, it's good, it's probably the most helpful thing. <laughs> you can see that a lot of the degradation, look, happens in the, when your phone is basically almost completely charged, right? So, and now if you plug your phone in, the iPhone will tell you that they're gonna stop charging and they'll charge before you're ready to use. It's most likely because of curves like this, where they know that a lot of the degradation will happen when the battery's at the top of charge, and what's the point? If you're sleeping, you're not gonna use it, right? Good. So, pipe bam. If you now go back to that slide where I was showing like the, the cell, the module, the rack, the system, what we are doing, and this is work we're doing in my group in collaboration with Oak Ridge, we are now expanding from the single cell to the module. So now pipe bomb is not just used for a single cell, but it's used for one, two, for eight cells in parallel, right? So this is the, first, it's the next step. And the, Things, again, kind of work. So this is the uh, battery voltage and current from the simulations. This is from the experiments. And these are the currents that each cell see. And you can see, right, just like there is a distribution of different currents on the simulated cells, you get the same thing on the real cells, right? So the, most of the physics is being captured. But, the, but then again, you know, there are all these variations which are due to the fact that not two cells are exactly the same, right? And we still, we yet haven't figured out how to model that part. And for this one, just to give you, to show that this thing is actually, if I can, <laughs> I'll do it like that, see if I can do this. Okay. What is it say? Oh, no. oh, skip. So this is where this goes in the set of tools that maybe most of you are used to using. So, you know, Lion Pack, is, you can be downloaded through, um, from PIP. And um, this is a Jupyter Notebook. And um, you can set the number of cells in parallel and series. Right, so now we are in the realm in which this is computer friendly, right? It's for, for people like, you know, have dealt with programming. And then this is actually a very cool add-on. How many of you have, used, have ever used latex to write document? Okay, good. This is a latex add-on, it's pretty cool. You can build circuits. It's like, it's the beauty of, of open source, right? Like this was maybe built, I don't even know how long ago. Maybe you know, but long time ago. He's the historian, so that's why I call on him sometimes. And then you can see, uh, where is it? Somewhere, this is the one. Then we are using parameters that were uh, obtained by looking at experiments that this guy Chen made available in 2020, right? So again, it's like, this is the, the only reason this simulation works is because this gentleman, this group, contributed enough information about their experiments that the PyBAM group could actually build uh, a set of models out of it. 
And then, you know, at this point, these are the results. You can have multiple cells in parallel. This is the current. This is the voltage. So now somebody can take this code and go from the module to the rack, the rack to the system, right? This doesn't need MREL, SMDN. Now this is within, you know, it's, it's, a computer pro it's a programming problem. So, which is what uh, people are working on. Now if I can find my presentation. Sweet. But, as I was saying before, not two batteries are the same. So this is actually experimental results uh, contributed by the, my friend in Hawaii. So, um, and you can see all these batteries, they're all running the exact same condition. But if you look at cycle 600, you can see that the best battery still retains about 70% of the capacity and the worst one retains about 50%. So there's a huge spread between the uh, performance of different batteries. And when you put them all together, when you go from the cell to the module, the pack, one bad cell will take your entire module down, right? So if it, it, and if we wanna build, quote unquote, digital twins of battery systems, we need to be able to capture this complexity. So what we started to do was to look at all the data in battery archive and use, and use the simplest, most traditional uh, machine learning approach we could think of. So, you know, some batteries have more data than others. We used elastic net. So we used elastic net, uh, so we linearized everything. Instead of using cycle number, we took the log of cycle number. And as features that we use in elastic net, we relied on the physics of the problem, like for instance, we look at capacity re retaining between cycle 10 and 100. Like, so how much capacity am I losing in the beginning of the life of the battery? And you can see that some of these features correlate well. Blue here means, this is the plot of this feature, dq over v. And you, blue means long cycle life, red means short cycle life, right? So you can see like these things correlate. And um, we ran our Skylearn Elastic net, which is again, thank you for that. That's a good package. And um, we uh, find that, and this is the uh, original cycle number, this is the predicted cycle number. You can see, like, when you have a lot of data, the agreement is pretty good. All the, all the dots, every dot is a cell. The closer are the dots to the diagonal, the better is the prediction, right? Very good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, not so good, not so good. It gets worse than worse, right? And, and this, this, is, this is like, it's a big problem, right? Because you find that if you wanna have accurate models of cell variation, you need a lot of cells. And cells data takes seven years to collect. And we have, and, 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 and you know, and, you, and of course, if the cells fail right away, it's fun, it's easy, right? They don't work. But if you wanna characterize cell to cell variations of cells that last, it's gonna take a decade, right? We don't have a decade. And also, the other problem with experimentalists is that they make mistakes. So like, this is outlier. Is this outlier because the cell was bad? Because it wasn't con connected correctly? Who knows, right? So this entire data set, right? Yes, you can remove this outlier and train, but are you missing out on physics? Are you compensating for somebody who made a mistake? So experiments alone are not enough. And that's where we have uh, developing this hybrid machine learning and physics based uh, models where we use uh, um, single particle models given a, a current signal. We generate the voltage using single particle models. We compare and then we, we use um, the singularity in each cell to, and this baseline data to try and train neural networks that then give us models that in principle not only contain the basics of the physics, but they have learned enough uh, about cell-to-cell -cell variation. And you can see, and, and this one used TensorFlow in the background, right? So again, we're going back 
to the tools in the community. And this one is kind of like this hybrid approach in which you're trying to take whatever you can out of the models and use whatever partial data you have to come up with models captures enough of this cell-to-cell -cell variation. And you can see this is how the neural network trains. This is uh, time, this is uh, bottom voltage, this is another measure of the capacity. And you know, the training, like for, now it's funny, like the training of this laptop to generate this plot, the training to, like, took like nine hours, okay? But then running this model takes fraction of a second, right? And if this model can only take you 80% there in predicting some of the cell-to-cell -cell variability, that will definitely you know, be an improvement on what's done today. So just to recap a little bit, and we're almost there. The, the, we're gonna collect demonstration data, lab data, and then what this group is trying to do for all those 15 technologies on one of the early slides is coming up with physics-based models and machine learning models that together will allow us to have the closest representation to how the systems work. And uh, hopefully, you know, do some good, let's see. Like, you know, even if we can save a company, one of the 15 companies, four or five years, you know, I think I'll take that as a success. So, and final thoughts. Uh, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of data. So I will certainly come back to this community. Each system has 200,000 cells. So 720, 720 million floats is 2.8 gigabytes. It's gonna be a lot of data, right? And then all this data needs to be, you gotta do something, you gotta move it around, and people need to download it, train model. It's gonna be quite the trick. And, um, and then as you see, the, um, the type of open source we need, it could be like, how do you process images, right? How do you model things? How do you combine existing pieces to build up the full system? And we, are, we suck at maintaining open source software. <laughs> National labs, we just don't know. We just, we, like there is a group of scientists, we'll do something, we'll put it out there and, uh, you know, so yeah. And a bunch of people did help me with this, like Julia, Joseph, Jacob, in my group, Candler Smith is a senior scientist at Envrev, Shrikant Hallo, senior scientist at Oak Ridge. Uh, oh, Irving Darin is one of the first software engineers I hired, which I've roped into developing for free for me as part of the... <laughs> yeah, and, and that's it, yeah, so thanks. So does any of this make any sense? Okay, okay, good. Any questions, anybody? Please. Well, the problem is the most of the companies that uh, uh, have most of the cell phones will not give us data. So like, um, but, I know that uh, through the Microsoft kernel, you can get data from lithium polymer cells. The problem is that the lithium polymer cells is a very expensive cells. So the cells that are used in most laptops I will never be inexpensive enough to uh, make it into uh, grid-based storage. But if any of you wants to help us write software to extract data, out of, like, does it, I think the Linux kernel also allows to get some battery data as well. Yeah, yeah, that, and maybe you can do it from the Android phones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, and this is kind of like how it goes. So, uh, companies like Tesla will not share anything. 
so, but to the point where the utilities buy these mega packs, spend millions of dollars, and they don't have access to the data. So, but, but we do have, uh, um, in Sandia, we have a DC microgrid, which is a commercial installation, and they do have battery packs, and we do get that data. So now you are installing a system. Yeah, what, what in your system, I don't know the brand, but I can guarantee you that there is a plug somewhere where I can get data at this level, but I think they will obfuscate the data at this level because they don't want you to know what's going on. So the various Samsung, LG. So I was in Korea last year working with the, an organization called Kesco. And the only reason uh, large Korean battery vendors are sharing data with the Korean government is because otherwise the Korean government will shut them down. So this is the threat of force, right? So we do hope that uh, uh, these companies that have DOE funding will, will be forthcoming and giving us data. I think to have underlying data for the study, what you guys are saying, going back to the kernel, will give us the cleanest data set, right? Because I can probably put out some code on the, some GitHub and all the developers will run and give me their battery information. Right? Yeah. yeah. What brand is your system, by the way? Uh, so, I haven't tried to play Yeah. I love it. it like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, B, you know, this is one of the things where, you know, you guys should put my email down for two reasons. One, because as Irving will tell you, I'll take any help I can get. I'm pretty good at guilting, no, not guilting. <laughs> <laughs> Motivating people. Uh, so yeah, but two reasons, but because a lot of this uh, uh, lithium iron phosphate cells that you find on the market, even some that you can get out of DigiKey are of questionable quality. So, and those are the kind of things, you know, that we know. I mean, that you can, you know, you can come to us, like this one, for example. These are like tier one, grade A, digi key, wow. lithium iron phosphate cells. And we bought 10, used eight, and one failed on the second cycle. So if our um, energy management system had not found this, this cell shorted, right? So you charge and discharge a short cell long enough, you're gonna get a thermal runaway, right? So it's kind of like the. I, I think to this day, if if you know, like we built we built an e-bike at home, uh, my son and I, and we used Samsung cells. You know, they were like four times the cost of anything else. So those are the kind of stuff I caution, you know, because this stuff. I've seen it, when one of these goes, it goes, and takes everything with it. Yeah, but actually, if you guys are, if, you're re, if, you're, if you really want to, like what you're saying, like if you build your system, and, if, uh, and add some software, the people that use your, your technology stack 
can use, we'll put it on GitHub. And then, you know, hopefully, I mean, probably if you put it on GitHub, more people will download it if I put it on GitHub. But nonetheless, you know, yeah, 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 no, thanks. So, any other question? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so as as um, that's a good question. So, as as we put these monitoring places into uh, these systems into place, somehow we depend on what the vendors will actually uh, do. But uh, I can tell you, like technologies like this, they tend to um, have hydrogen release. So like every zinc and zinc bromine, nobody wants to test the zinc bromine. <laughs> but they sell them, it's an Australian company. I mean, they make money out of it. But like this, uh, uh, don't put that it's in your, it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And definitely you don't want to be in your garage, no. But so like temperature is everywhere and um, gas composition and uh, distinguish different types of gas composition is very difficult. So like you will find, for example, that for some of these lithium-based systems, right, if you had the ability to really discern which gas were emitted at what point, it might prevent thermal runaway, but the problem you can't. And by the time you can, it's too late. You only have 15, 20 minutes to kind of prevent it. And another thing that we will depend on vendors is like, you know, how granular are their temperature measurements because you will want to have thermocouples throughout Iraq, right? But then energy storage has to be cheap. Everything has to be cheap because, you know, things have to cost like $10 a kilo, whatever. And so that's where people cut corners and, you know, yeah. 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 So there are multi. There are, traditionally, people have been doing accelerated testing using temperature, because temperature will accelerate the kinetics. So everything runs faster. So things will degrade faster. But sometimes cells fail because of humidity level. Sometimes cells because of pressure. Sometimes it's because of particular uh, profiles, and that's why you know, like we, are, we have an entire trust on building test procedures. And uh, the part that really it becomes um, difficult to, at this point, to quantify is that if you look at this diagram, right, some of this growth is okay. That's what makes the batteries work. At the top of the anode, there's always an SCI layer, which for reasons I, don't, I can't quite explain, it's necessary for the charge to be from, the, from actually for the lithium particles to actually make it into the carbon uh, matrix. So you need a little bit of SCI, but if you have too much, it will pierce the separator in short, right? So under what set so you're, you have to translate this not only to how the battery is used, but you have to have enough control on the environment in which the battery is made. Because what is this? Maybe the mixing wasn't right, or the coding wasn't right, or the rolling wasn't right, or it was, like people say, it was 72 degrees outside with 72% humidity, or like uh, the funny story, like a friend of mine, Originally, our family is from Sicily. Tells the story that at the A123, which is this battery company that came and went out of MIT, they were having failures because there was a higher content of salt in their electrode, and they just say, "Why is this salt in the electrode?" This is Unless they figured, until they figured out that the workers would buy burgers with fries <laughs> and eat the fries in the clean room. What? Uh, <laughs> 
So. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, so, you know, but, but that's actually, and the, it's also what is the value of the item, right? Because the semiconductor industry has been able, like if you look at silicon carbide MOSFETs, the yield of silicon carbide MOSFETs have been going up. And the reason it's been going up is because they're highly valuable for EV charging, power conversion, right? The problem is like if you're trying to sell something for like literally at the cost of dirt, then it becomes really difficult to implement all these possible manufacturing safeguards, right? So, and that's, and that's, and that's what I think, you know, at the end of it, there will be in this list, there will be winner or losers. The tech, the company, the technologies that require very accurate and precise manufacturing and monitoring and sensing and control will fail. And the companies that will survive are the companies that are a little bit, their technology is more robust, which is uh, the closest example I can give to that is lead acid batteries, right? Lead acid batteries is cold, it's hot, it doesn't matter, right? Your car will always start, right? So, and, and that's, you know, in a way, and don't quote me on this, if our Rovi screening can find those four or five technologies, you know, that are more robust out of this list, then we can have done our job, right? So, okay. And I think we're supposed to leave the room. So thanks so much. I really appreciate the listening. And Alga, you are like on my list now. <laughs> and, and you. Yeah, yeah, because, and you. Because if you guys do this, we like to help, you know? Yeah, we like for instance, we can give you our charging protocols. So you don't have to reinvent them, things like that. So anyway, thank you. <laughs>